Welcome to Hope for Right Now, a Walking with Purpose podcast. Walking with Purpose is a Catholic women's apostolate that creates fresh and relevant Bible studies to lead women to personally know Christ through Scripture. Hi, I'm Lisa Brennickmeyer, and I'm joined by Laura Phelps. We are two friends passionate about unpacking God's Word and applying it to our everyday lives. Each week, we will step out of the discouragement the world provides by grabbing hold of the hope we find in God's Word. Never have we been more convinced of the importance of women being grounded in hope. No matter where you are in the spiritual journey, we pray you'll stick around because God has a word for your heart and his word changes everything. So open your heart, open your Bible and invite God in. Hello and welcome back to the Hope for Right Now podcast. I'm your host, Lisa Brennickmeyer. And I'm your other host, Laura Phelps, and we are so excited to be back with you this week. We are continuing to read in this first season some passages from the book of John. We're doing the famous I Am Statements by Jesus. So this is week number two of our seven-week series on encountering Jesus personally in the Gospel of John. And we're continuing on this journey of letting Jesus' life and words about himself speak for him with each of his I am statements. So if you were able to listen last week, last week we explored his words, I am the bread of life. And this week, super excited, we're going to look at the second I am statement, I am the light of the world. So if you are able to grab a hold of your Bibles, go on ahead. We're going to delve into John 8, verse 12. And this is where Jesus says, I am the light of the world. And so what we want to do is we want to explore what this revelation of who Jesus is has to do with us today. And we're going to explore how Jesus, the light of the world, is the only one who can totally dispel our darkness. And I'm just going to go out on a limb. I think maybe there's a listener or two out there who's a little familiar with the darkness. So I'm excited to dive into this. Lisa, can you please give us some background on this passage? Sure. So what strikes me most about Jesus's words, I'm the light of the world in John 8, 12, is where and when he says them. So this is taking place during the Feast of Tabernacles in Jerusalem. And we can see later from John 8, 20, that Jesus is speaking in the treasury, which is a place within the temple. And a little bit of background on this feast is helpful. The Feast of Tabernacles was also called the Feast of Booths, and I'm going to explain why in a second. And this was the Feast of Joy, of flourishing, of happiness. And it was also called the Feast of Ingathering, a feast to celebrate that they all belonged. So God explained in the Old Testament how he wanted it to be celebrated. And we find that explanation in Leviticus chapter 23, verse 42. And what he told his people was, I would like you to dwell in booths, little huts, for seven days. All that are native in Israel shall dwell in booths, that your generation may know that I made the sons of Israel dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. And the word tabernacle or booth are both words used to describe these little houses that were built for this feast. So once the Hebrew people were settled in the promised land, God wanted them to celebrate this feast, the Feast of Tabernacles, every year during the fall harvest so that they could remember that period of wandering, that period of 40 years of wandering in the wilderness when they were coming out of Egypt and before they were in the promised land. And God had laid out really specifically how he wanted that feast to be celebrated. And it's fascinating because to this day, we can see in Israel the ways in which his wishes are still being carried out. And throughout history, the Jewish people have journeyed to Jerusalem for this feast. So in order to remember those years of wandering, the people leave their comfortable homes and then they eat and sometimes even sleep in these little huts. These aren't permanent. The walls are like made out of branches, palm fronds. And so it's giving you some protection, but it doesn't shut out the sun. And one of the rules about these huts as they're built is that they have to have thatched roofs. And the thatching has to be wide enough so that you can see the stars at night. And this was for a reason. This was to remind them of what it had been like to be wanderers and to remind them of God's provision. So there was a special ceremony that all the people looked forward to at the Feast of Tabernacles, and it took place on the evening of the second day of the feast. And it was called the Illumination of the Temple. This took place in the Court of Women. And the courtyard was lined with galleries, which were put up to hold the people who had come to watch. And in the center of this courtyard were four gorgeous candelabras. 
And as night fell, the candelabras were lit. And I just want you to kind of picture this with me. And this light from the candelabras combined with the light from the oil lamps in many of the booths that are surrounding the temple, those little temporary huts that had been built for this purpose, all of that together set up a blaze of light throughout Jerusalem. And it truly was one of the most beautiful sights imaginable. And then after the lights were lit all night long, the greatest and the wisest and the holiest men in Israel danced before the Lord and sang psalms of joy and praise while the people all sat and watched. So I want you to picture that with me. Imagine the most pious and religious people that you know dancing their hearts out, playing songs, worshiping God with total abandon. Picture somebody, who do you know that's really holy and really dignified, but this night dancing for all that they're worth. This was a display of pure joy and their elation was infectious and it lasted all night long. And this celebration happened every night from that second night of the feast until the final night. So back to the Gospel of John. So in chapter eight, we see that they've come to the end of the festivities. So the people have enjoyed days and days of celebration and beauty. But now in John eight, the lights are coming down. And I can imagine that it felt the same way it does when all the beautiful Christmas lights come down and things start to seem a little bit plain, you know, when we have to put all of that magic back into the boxes. It's at this point that we find Jesus standing in the temple treasury, which was in the court of women. And just as the temporary beautiful lights were being put away, Jesus chose that moment to say, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So those lights and the illumination of the temple were beautiful, but they were temporary. And Jesus was speaking to that longing inside of all of us, that longing for beauty and for enlightenment and said, I am your light. If you will walk with me, you will never walk in darkness. I am permanent light. And if you want your mind and your heart to be enlightened in such a way that lasts, then let me be your light. So that's some background on that passage. But Laura, do you have any thoughts on how we can take all of that and apply it to our own lives? Oh, gosh. Yeah. You know, I just I just want to say two words off of the bat, and that's permanent light. When you said that, you know, like this, this word permanent, I think I even texted it to you recently, Lisa, like it's just speaking to my heart lately. And it's definitely I feel like it's a message that the Lord has been whispering and not so quietly in my ear lately. And especially right now, um, I don't know about you, but I'm in a season right now where it feels like everything is passing away. Everything is changing. Everything is breaking. And like, honestly, that's just my body. (laughs) But it's like, everything is different and changing. And I think it's just what happens as we get older, you know, like these temporary things that we have not only held so tightly, but also relied on to make us feel happy or fulfilled or purposeful. These all just inevitably start to pass away. You know, it's like, think about it, like our children, like our children are growing up and then they leave us and our parents, we're watching them age and they, they die and, and we go up a pant size, right? Because thanks for nothing, menopause, <laughs> like honestly. But I, I have to say, like, there was literally, this is a true story. There was one week back in early September, my treadmill, dryer, garbage disposal and air conditioning system all broke at once, like within hours of each other. And I remember thinking like, okay, Lord, like I totally get it, right? Nothing is certain. Nothing is guaranteed. Nothing is forever. Nothing is permanent. And then I thought, except you. And, um, you know, Lisa, when you were unpacking this verse, you referenced really what I think is a depression (laughs) that people experience when they take down their Christmas lights. You know, like how many people talk about how sad they are on December 26th, you know, like everything comes down and and they're all sad. Like when these temporary lights that they love so much are put away that they feel a sadness. And this might sound like a stretch to some of the listeners, but just hear me out. When I heard you say that, I couldn't help but think about Job. Like, honestly, like if Job heard me complain about my treadmill and my dryer breaking in the same week, I'm pretty sure he'd roll his eyes and probably have a few choice words for me, right? Like this is a guy who experienced the greatest life changes in the shortest span of time. Like he lost everything precious. He lost his children, his possessions, his health. And like, 
I'm sorry, but he was also covered in boils. And I don't get that. Like that to me is horrific. I don't even think they had dermatologists. Like, what do you do? He couldn't go to Walgreens and like handle his boils. Like it was all terrible. But anyway, I digress. The point is the things that I'm certain brought Job light and joy, they were gone in an instant. Life for him would never be the same. Life for Job, I think every listener can agree, it appeared pretty dark. Like that was pretty dark. And yet how, how does he respond? He turns his gaze toward the permanent and he worships God. And this is truly one of my favorite verses in scripture. It's in Job chapter one, verse 20 to 22, when he says, I came into this world with nothing and will return with nothing. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. How many of us have experienced the Lord taking away, right? Like we've all experienced that. And so when I think of Job and this response to the darkness, like his response, this can only happen when we recognize and believe that Jesus actually is who he says he is, right? That Jesus is the light of the world. And I'm so grateful. Can I just say, I'm so grateful that we're talking about this verse today, because let's be honest, I think the world looks really dark. I think there's a lot of darkness covering a lot of people. And, you know, could that be just a theory, my friends, but could that possibly be? Because God, the light, right? Jesus, the light of the world is slowly being removed from everything. You know, the one that sheds his light on our sins so that we can begin the healing process. We're removing him. The one that sheds his light on who we are and what our purpose is. Getting rid of him, you know? The one who is a permanent light in our time of personal darkness is being removed. And so we have to ask, what are we replacing him with? Like, what are you listening to replacing him with? For most of us, I think we'd say the temporary, right? The things we can't control, the material and earthly possessions, our children, our bodies, our bank accounts, like the list goes on and on. What about like our faces? Like we are trying to make our faces look permanently youthful. Like we are actually trying to do that, to stop the clock and look youthful. And, you know, here's the kicker. Can I just say, my friends, it doesn't work. We all look creepy. So like everybody just like keep the face you were born with. You're beautiful. But the truth is, the truth is at the end of the day, with all of our hope placed in what are really temporary solutions to what I believe is a permanent longing, can we truly look in the mirror and say, I am satisfied? You know, I don't think we can. I don't believe that temporary things will ever offer us a freedom the kind of freedom that Jesus offers. And like, honestly, this is why we wanted to do the podcast, right? Because I mean, who can't do a podcast today? My cat's going to start one tomorrow. Like we can all have a podcast, but we wanted to do this because we know Jesus, right? We know that his light shines the brightest when we take the time to know him. And we, we know that when we start our days with prayer, when we make scripture reading a daily habit and we receive him in the Eucharist as often as we can, when we get together in our small groups, these are the ways that we grow closer to him. And then as our hearts are filled with his light, his presence, then that tight grip we have on all those temporary things, it does loosen. It will loosen. But I think best of all is that when this happens, his light in us, it begins to shine in such a way that we become beacons of hope. We can become a light that shines in someone else's darkness. And I'm sorry, but I think that's everything. I think that's everything. And, you know, I said it last week when we talked about Jesus as the bread of life, and I'm going to go out and say it again. And I'm going to say it like directly to our listeners, all of your longing, all of your longing, it is for Jesus. He is the permanent that your heart longs for. He's the permanent that my heart longs for. Laura, that's that's just so powerful. I just want to sit with all of that. And something that really strikes me when you said that it's a huge thing when we can become a light that shines in someone else's darkness. I have found that to be one of the most powerful things because when we walk through suffering, I think what makes one of the things that makes it so hard, well, one is definitely not understanding the why, senseless, what seems to be senseless suffering feels just agonizing. But it's also when we feel super isolated and lonely in our suffering. And so when we walk through some kind of suffering and then God comforts us and gets us through it, and then we see a similar level of suffering in another person and we go to them and we can be some kind of light and encouragement, 
the satisfaction that brings, I think it does, it brings meaning into suffering that isn't necessarily tied to this happened, it was awful, and this is why. But you can find meaning in the moment. So I just couldn't agree with you more that when we step out and we're honest about our own experience of darkness and suffering and then step into someone else's, it is such a transformative experience and and so important. Also just wanted to circle back to something you said earlier, which is not so deep, but still, I think if we're going to talk about that pull between what is permanent and what really matters in the temporary, I just want to go back and say that you were so right about the fact that how we are changing our faces and being obsessed with youth is actually making us look creepy. I was just laughing when you said it, but I thought it is so true. I don't know about you, but I have Googled different celebrities who've gone under the knife and done this and that and gone too far and they don't look like themselves. And with all of it, you just think, oh my goodness, it screams insecurity. You don't look like yourself anymore. Even if technically certain aspects of your face are beautiful, overall, it's It's just not good. But even as I can do that and think that, at the same time, I can get caught up in it comparing myself to younger women or obsessing over extra weight. And yet at the end of the day, and Lori, you and I have talked about this, what I really want, and I know that what you really want, is to grow in spiritual maturity. And I want to be my age and hopefully wiser with each passing year. And for that not to be weirdly incongruous, I need to look my age. I need to look my age. You know, Laura and I are the same age, kind of fun fact. We're both 53, graduated the same year of high school, 88. Oh, so great. And Laura, you need to look your age and I need to look mine and we need to let go of this pursuit of these temporary things which do not matter because our eyes need to be fixed on the eternal. And this has so been brought home to me right now because um, my mother-in-law just passed away. And being with her at the end of her life, you know, sitting for 10 days just by her bedside with family brought it home so, so clearly that the temporary just does not matter. But that being said, those temporary things can sure fill a day and actually they can fill a life. But then at the end, what do we have to show for it? But even knowing this... Even feeling the Lord speak those things to my heart as I sat by my mother-in-law by her bed at the end of her life. I found myself this week looking at old photographs of mom and we were, you know, prepping for the reception after the funeral. And so these are photos from back from before I met her. And do you know what I found myself doing, even with all this good work that God's doing in my head in terms of teaching me things and teaching me perspective, where my brain was going is I was actually comparing myself to her at my age. So her at my age, me at my age, and feeling crummy about my skin compared to hers. I mean, that is so messed up, but that is where I think as women, our minds can go. The comparison and the focus on outward beauty can just weasel its way into our thoughts. So what do we do with this? Do we just ride the train down? Um, No, I would say we grab hold of ourselves. So this is what I've been doing is I grab hold of myself and the freight train of my thoughts. And I have to ask myself, what bothers me more? Okay, I'm going to compare two things. Which of these two things, if I'm honest, bothers me more? One, The thought of Jesus shedding light on areas of my life where I am attached to things that just do not matter. So this is a thought of Jesus being disappointed in where I am spending my time obsessing over stuff, right? Where my brain is going. Or am I more bothered by the thought that the lighting in my office, and this is a true thing, makes me look super pale and wrinkled on Zoom. So which of those two things do I spend more time thinking about? Well, I'll be honest, if I'm on Zoom all day, I'm probably thinking about the latter way more than I should. And I've been so checked in my spirit over the way my inclination is to go towards this superficial stuff. I'm reading this book called The Spiritual Combat by Dom Lorenzo Scapoli, and it is impacting the way that I pray. So just a little shout out for this book. It's one that St. Francis de Sales called This Golden Book, and he actually carried a copy of it in his pocket for 18 years. Um, That being said, I'm giving this endorsement with a little bit of nervousness because Leo always laughs at me because I wholeheartedly recommend a book when I've only read a chapter of it. Um, In my defense, I am on chapter eight, but there are 66 chapters. So I do see his point. So take what I'm saying as a recommendation with a grain of salt. But I just read something yesterday in it that really convicted me. And Scapoli was talking about four things we need if we're going to engage in the spiritual battle. And one of those four things he called the right use of our faculties. And what that basically means is thinking about life from God's perspective and seeking the light of the Holy Spirit so that we see rightly. 
right? So if we aren't doing that, if we're not thinking straight, thinking right, thinking well, making right use of our mental faculties, then we are not going to make it in the spiritual battle. And specifically, this is what convicted me. I read that if I want to be serious about the right use of my faculties, referring to the way that I think, then this is what I need to do. I need to persistently apply myself to the serious and diligent examination of every object in order to distinguish the good from the evil. And Scapoli writes that if I will commit myself to this, then I will clearly see that what the world pursues with such eagerness and affection is mere vanity and illusion. So this is challenging me to grab hold of what I am thinking most about and then hold it up to the light of Christ. And I need to ask him, do you care about this? Should I care about this? And then adjust myself accordingly. And what I am realizing more and more is that I really care a lot about things that Jesus says do not really matter at all. And I need to pray for his help to get rid of those attachments. I need his help to get rid of my jowls because I'm looking at myself on on this, like, it's a problem. It's because we're looking at ourselves all day. It's, It's because of the Zoom calls, right? But I need his help. Lisa, that was so Beautiful. And can I just say, I'm going to go ahead and endorse the book. And I never read it, but I'm a huge Francis de Sales fan. And I don't think you could ever go wrong. So in the show notes, check. It's going to be in my Amazon cart in five minutes. I really do love what you said. Um, on a serious note, those, those two questions, do you care about this? Should I care about this? So good. So good. I think we should all like indelible marker, write that on our arms because that's a keeper. That's really great. I too recently found myself. I'm going to be totally honest. I I found myself utterly, I mean, utterly consumed with temporary things. And I will share this story with you. It is a true story. But my dear friend, Kathy, she texted me one afternoon. She had learned of this anthropology, the store, anthropology and free people. She learned that there was an outlet of their merchandise just 20 minutes away from our home and asked if I wanted to go and look for pretty dresses. Now, here's the thing. We had just been talking the day before about our desire to build a more feminine and modest wardrobe. I promise you, like this was dresses for Jesus. Like we just wanted to look pretty for Jesus. And so we went totally in the hopes of just finding pretty modest dresses. But what I had no idea, oh my word, is that this place First of all, it's incredibly suspicious. It's like an unmarked warehouse. And you walk inside and it had not only the clothing, but the largest assortment of the most beautiful anthropology furniture. Like I'm talking desks and dressers and armoires and shelves. Like it went on and on. And they're all for a fraction of the price that you would find in the stores. It's bananas. And the way that this place works is, and this is genius, genius marketing, It's not open every week. It's not even open every day. And you need to like weasel your way onto this special email list just to know when they've got a new shipment of merchandise coming and then you can go and shop. So what it does is it creates this total sense of urgency and fear of missing out if you don't go when they're open. Like you have no idea. Like, so you've just got to get there. And I have literally gotten texts from Kathy while in the middle of working and she's like, it's open, it's open. And I will drop everything, like absolutely everything and run. And if you know me, like I'm kind of a workaholic, like I don't drop work for anything, maybe your funeral, but like, that's it. And I drop everything. And honestly, it's because I am so afraid that my dream piece of furniture is there and I'm not, and someone else is going to grab it. Like, if you notice, like, I'm not even sharing what this place is called because I don't want the listeners going. (laughs) Like, and I'm not even joking. Like, this is mine. It's, it has literally brought out the worst in me. And like, not just me, but also my husband. Okay. Love my husband. We are terrible influences on each other. We just like drop and go. And there was a week, we, we go multiple times a week if it's open, multiple times a week. And every time we load the car with furniture and we pull out, I look at my husband and I say, okay, we're done now, right? Like we're done now. But then this is the problem. Then we get home and I put the new furniture in my bedroom. You know, I put the bedside tables next to the bed and I look and it's like, well, obviously now we need new lamps, right? Like to what end? There's no end to it. And it has truly become a problem so much so that like we're concealing it 
from our son. Okay. My son is 17 years old. The other day he was like, are we running a furniture warehouse? Because we have brought so much new furniture in our house. Like we haven't gotten rid of the old yet. Our house is bananas right now and we're hiding it from our son. It's like total addiction, right? Like, like, but at least we, we know. <laughs> That's what I say. I know I have an addiction because we're acknowledging it, but I'm lying to my son and telling him I'm running errands because I'm too ashamed to admit that I'm going to buy more furniture. And you would think that like when you're lying to your loved ones, that that would be a wake up call, but no, it wasn't. I'll tell you what was though. So one morning, true story, I'm sitting in my new cow print swivel prayer chair, <laughs> in my office. And it was literally out of nowhere that a scripture verse just came to me. And it was Luke chapter 12, verse 34. And I heard this so loud and clear, like not even in my head, but in my heart. And it was for where your treasure is, there will also your heart be. And I immediately thought back to just just the morning before, the day before, where um, I had gone to an 8 a.m. mass. And I want to say there were about maybe 30 people there that morning to worship God, to worship the permanent, our permanent God, right? And right after mass, I drove directly to this warehouse of furniture where there was a line of over a hundred people wrapped around the building. And what were they doing? They were in line waiting to worship the temporary. And I am by no means judging anyone on that line because my friends, I was one of them. And I think, I don't think I know, it is so easy. It is so easy, all too easy to worship the wrong things, right? And especially, like, let's be honest, especially when life is hard, right? When we are lonely or grieving or when we are in pain, <laughs> this is super easy. And, and I will share with you that um, it is no coincidence that my furniture binge <laughs> just so happened to coincide with the season of deep grieving. And I hadn't even really been aware of it, but I was in pain. I was, I was grieving a loved one that I have not seen in a very long time. And um. I didn't want to follow the light of the world. (laughs) I didn't. I didn't want it. I wanted the cheap substitute. I wanted something that gave me that rush of excitement or that dopamine hit, just like something that would make me feel good momentarily, but ultimately wasn't going to last. And I've really been thinking a lot about that. You know, I wish I wish I could say that I would run to Jesus the way I ran to my new couch. You know, like with that same excitement, I wish I felt just as excited when I went to mass or when I prayed. But the truth is, I don't always feel that excitement, right? I don't always feel that way. And all I could say is praise God, right? Like praise God. Thank you for Jesus, the light of the world. Because when he shined his light into my heart that morning, when I heard that scripture verse, I didn't like what it revealed. It's kind of like, like, you know, when the sun shines through your window and onto your coffee table. And you're like, oh my word, that is like a filthy table. There's so much dust. Like the light, it doesn't hide anything. It reveals everything. And I did not like what was in my heart, but I was grateful for the reminder. Like I immediately thanked God for that reminder. And it actually reminded me of this really beautiful line in an old prayer that says, all day long in every varying circumstance, may my watchword be, how does this look in the light of eternity? And I think that that would do us well to ask those questions in those moments, right? How does this look in the light of eternity? So we've got some parting questions for you all, my friends. Um, something you can chew on over this next week, because my guess would be we can all relate, right, to these these pulls towards the temporary And so I want us all to take some time to journal, to think about this. What temporary things are you thinking are going to give you permanent light? And could it be that if you would stop looking to those things in your longing for beauty and enlightenment and would instead turn to the light of the world, you might be satisfied in a deeper way? So let's close in prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Jesus, you are the light of the world. And you shine no matter the season, no matter the day, no matter the hardship, and you shine light into our souls so we can see ourselves as you see us. And you shine light on our path, and you're always shining up forward, trying to get us to lift our eyes to the eternal, to what goes beyond. And I just pray we would be women who live wisely who don't fill our days with the temporary, but that we would lift up objects in our lives, but also just the things that we are giving our focus and our time to. And we would look at them and say, is this something, Lord, that you really care about? 
And if it isn't, then maybe I shouldn't so much either. Give us hearts, Lord God, that love what you love, that long for you. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks for listening to Hope for Right Now, a Walking with Purpose podcast. We would love for you to subscribe, share today's episode with a friend, and leave a rate and review. And don't forget, subscribe to our weekly newsletter. This is where you'll get sneak peeks into new content, special events, and exclusive discounts sent directly to your inbox. Finally, we know how important it is to keep the conversation going. So we've created a private Facebook group exclusive to listeners like you. You can find the newsletter and Facebook details all in our show notes. It's our privilege to unpack God's word with you, and we can't wait to do it again next week. Until then, friends, don't forget to open your heart, open your Bible, and invite God in.